while exploring Kennecott Glacier in the summer of 1900, directed there by the local native tribes that inhabited the valley, prospectors Clarence Warner and Tarantula Jack Smith spotted what appeared to be a large patch of grass high up on the mountainside. After a treacherous hike, they quickly realized that the grass was not vegetation at all, but what was yet to become the most prosperous deposit of copper ever discovered, over 70% pure and completely untouched, boring hundreds of feet into the rock. They quickly established the Bonanza mining claim at the location, along with dozens of other claims in the area, developing them into the town of Kennecott. By 1938, over 1.3 billion pounds of copper would be extracted from the mountainside, with nearly all coming from the Bonanza claim and three additional nearby mines, Jumbo, Erie, and Motherlode, each situated about 4,000 feet above the Kennecott Glacier and the surrounding valley. Now abandoned, though partially restored, the highly cherished copper mining town of Kennecott stands as a testament to the bravery and hardships that thousands of people who settled and worked in the area went through to make a living. Between 1911 and 1938, just 27 years, this mine produced incredible amounts of copper, all shipped by train through the Alaskan wilderness to the port of Cordova, nearly 200 miles away. With incredible feats of technology and human willpower, Kennecott Mine excavated over 4.6 million tons of ore, it grossed an astounding $200 million, or adjusted for inflation, over $4 billion today. Few people have heard of Kennecott, and even fewer have made the visit to the quiet relic town. Its legacy continues today as the company is overseeing Utah's massive Bingham copper mine. Still, its roots began in the great state of Alaska, the last frontier of the United States. Listed as one of the richest copper mines in history, along with the highest copper purity ever discovered, Kennecott can be credited for many improvements that utilize the material worldwide, including powering the United States through the copper and power lines still hung around the nation today. It was a revolutionary place, too, a pioneer of mining and processing technology, also isolated in the deep Alaskan wilderness. Today, Kennecott is protected by the National Park Service in Wrangell St. Elias National Park and is heralded as a historic engineering marvel. The many structures have since collapsed and have been removed, some of the most important buildings still stand, giving an insight into the unique history of this town and its facilities as it worked to extract every ounce of copper it could from raw ore. Beginning construction in 1909, the new Alaska Syndicate, later the Kennecott Copper Corporation, dominated the industry with massive yearly outputs and hit peak production in 1916, with $32.4 million of copper produced. Today, that'd be worth over $900 million, all earned in just one year. The towering remains of Kennecott's red 14-story concentration mill, standing as a silent testament to this industrious period, dominate the landscape as an important historical landmark. With its imposing structure, this mill once boasted cutting-edge technology that revolutionized the copper processing and set new standards for the productivity in the early 20th century. Arriving at the mill over a 30-minute aerial tramway ride, high-grade ore, typically greater than 60% purity, was crushed and packed into large sacks, while lower-grade ore was crushed smaller and sorted from waste. Ammonia leaching and froth flotation then separated and extracted the copper from limestone, achieving over 75% purity. All relatively new techniques for their time, the leaching and flotation plants, built in 1915 and 1923, heralded a new generation of copper processing. Given the remoteness of Kennecott, the existence and size of these engineering marvels in such a location stands paramount as one of the most incredible feats of mining technology. Having to transport massive amounts of steel, machinery, and materials by train that were not locally accessible, as well as harvesting lumber and utilizing other resources from the area, the town's size and production history have rarely been seen since its closure in 1938. Venturing into Kennecott today, visitors are transported back a century in time, wandering through the skeletal frames of the once bustling mining structures. The echoes of the past resonate in the rusted machinery and remnants of a bygone mining community and offer a glimpse into the challenges and triumphs faced by those who made a residence in this remote outpost town. Beyond the physical remnants, the landscape surrounding Kennecott holds its own allure. Stark glaciers and the towering mountains of Wrangell St. Elias National Park provide a breathtaking backdrop, inviting visitors to reflect on the delicate balance between human ambition and the rugged wilderness that embraced Kennecott. 
Alaska was bought from Russia by the United States in 1867, the empire ceding over half a million square miles for just $7.2 million, or two cents per acre. That is $125 million as of 2022, or 34 cents per acre. Many lauded the purchase, while those against the sale considered Alaska a useless land of ice, swamp, and forest. For nearly 30 years, Alaska remained sparsely populated and seldom explored. Though slight booms occurred, most wouldn't last more than a few years. Sitka, for instance, saw its population fall from 2,500 to just a few hundred by 1873. Seal fishery was Alaska's primary industry for decades. In the afternoon of August 16, 1896, American prospector George Carmack and his native wife Kate and taggish men Skookum Jim and Dawson Charlie found gold nuggets along Rabbit Creek south of Dawson City in the Yukon Territory. Named Discovery Claim, this location along the now named Bonanza Creek is heralded as the starting point of the Klondike Gold Rush. Though it's unknown who of the group spotted the original nugget, Carmack was named the official discoverer, fearing reluctance from authorities to recognize a native claimant. The following day, they staked four claims. Two, the first being Discovery, or laid claim for Carmack himself, and the others claimed on behalf of Jim and Charlie. News spread like wildfire among mining camps in the Yukon, and within two weeks, the entirety of the Bonanza River had been claimed. Richer sources were later claimed by those who moved further up the river toward El Dorado Creek, where sources proved to outperform those along Bonanza. Despite the approaching winter, many hoping to stake a claim in the area left by dog sled toward the Yukon River. By spring of next year, glaciers began melting and the ice receded, and come June, boats left the area with hauls of gold. The Stampede North truly began the next month in July 1897. News had spread quickly around the lower 48, and Americans from all over the country were now on a mission to be a part of the gold rush, eager to strike it rich during a period of economic turmoil and recessions. July 14, 1897, in San Francisco, was the date of the first prospectors returning from the Klondike region. Press reports tell of over $1.1 million being returned on two ships, Excelsior and Portland. In 2010 prices, that sum is equivalent to over $1 billion. A second arrival and three days later in Seattle solidified the news of the gold's existence, and within days, thousands of young men began up north. Most had little, if any, experience in mining, coming from clerk positions. Layoffs began to plague the Northwest, including Seattle Mayor William D. Wood and 12 of the city's policemen. Newspapers called the sensation clondicitis. Despite the rush in 1897, a few American prospectors had worked their way up the Copper River a decade prior, beginning in 1882 with a man named C. George Holt. He was the first American to explore deep in the Copper River Valley, known as the first man to cross the famed Chilkoot Pass to Klondike with native guides. He then turned his attention toward the Wrangles. While dredging through the area, he tended to follow the local Atna, learning to cross the treacherous Copper River. Unfortunately, in 1885, he was ambushed and killed by natives near the Nick River. John Bremner, another pioneer in the Copper River Valley, prospected in the lower regions of the river in 1884. He named the local Atna the Copper Indians, or Yellow Knives, named so because of their extravagant tools and weapons that donned the precious metal. Marrying an Atna woman, he lived in the cabin along the river and was referred to by the natives as Manuska. Though he maintained good relations with natives in the area, he was eventually also ambushed along a tributary of the Yukon River in 1888. Natives stole his rifle and boat, killing him. Around the same time in 1884, Lieutenant William Abercrombie was dispatched to explore the Copper River. General Nelson A. Miles commanded him to travel the length of the river and explore the Tanana River further to the north, justifying the exploration by noting the importance of gathering information pertaining to the natives and their perceived hostility toward white people. However, upon entering the river, Abercrombie and his men found that the path was incredibly difficult. The frigid waters severely hampered any efforts to move inland, and huge, building-sized ice chunks destroyed many of their supplies. In all, he was only able to make it about 60 miles up the Copper River near Child's Glacier, deciding to turn back when huge ice chunks, some hundreds of feet in size, threatened their party when moving with the current. Abercrombie was convinced that the river was unsuitable for navigation. Not yet convinced of its impossibility, the army then dispatched another man, Lieutenant Henry Terman Allen, to the Copper River in 1885. His journey would become akin to the likes of Lewis and Clark, 
trekking nearly 1,600 miles of untamed wilderness along the Copper, Tanana, and Cuyacuc rivers. The purpose was to gather ethnic and geographic data. The trek set out to do exactly that, to establish suitable routes that could provide easier access into the Alaskan interior. Allen, with only three years of service under his belt, was up for the momentous task. He, along with Sergeant Katie Robertson and Private Fred Fickett, reached C. George Holt in March of 1885, gaining valuable information from him. Unlike Abercrombie, Allen's early start allowed him to use sleds and snowshoes given the still frozen ground in the early spring. It took them just a week to travel to Abercrombie's furthest reached point, and all but 11 days to reach the village of Taral, where the party added John Bremner. Food was a problem, and the men met with famed native Chief Nikolai, who was the chief of the Copper River Atna. He provided them not only supplies, but also granted them knowledge of copper sources in the mountains. In fact, Tarantula Jack Smith and Clarence Warner, the original claimants of Bonanza Mine in Kennecott, were members of the original McClellan party from which this trip branched. In return for his generosity, Chief Nikolai's legacy can be found included in many local geographic place names. Nearly 1,200 miles of river were, for the first time, charted, mapped, and recorded by white travelers. This previously and almost completely unknown land had finally been open for future exploration and settlement. Lieutenant Allen remarked that, from this time on, we began the true meaning of the much-used expression, living on the country. With the boom of the gold rush in 1897, Abercrombie returned to the Copper River, reaching a considerably greater distance inland than their previous expedition, to the present-day town of Copper Center. He pioneered a new trail from the Valdez north in 1899, with John McCarthy, the future namesake of Kennecott's vice town McCarthy, which still exists today, took and settled. The local creek named after him was granted in exchange for supplies, given to him by one of Abercrombie's advisors, who also provided the name Kennecott. The sudden, steady influx of white prospectors deeper into the Copper River Valley and up near present-day Kennecott began the sharpest decline of the Atnik population. After discovering Bonanza Mine, with a number of friends and associates, Warner and Smith quickly formed the Chitna Mining and Exploration Company. Dozens of other claims were staked in the area soon after the original, beginning what was to be Kennecott. Smith, writing to friend Stephen Birch, said, Mr. Birch, I've got a mountain of copper up there. There's so much of the stuff sticking out of the ground that it looks like a green sheep pasture in Ireland when the sun is shining at its best. Only weeks later, USGS geologist Arthur Coe Spencer stumbled upon the same prospect independently. Unfortunately, though he also understood the significance of the deposit, he was just too late to make any suitable claims. Due to a lack of personal financial capital, Smith and Warner turned to major investors such as Daniel and Simon Guggenheim and J.P. Morgan. In joining the venture, the various claims were thus conglomerated into the Alaska Syndicate in 1906, dividing its shares equally amongst M. Guggenheim and & Sons and J.P. Morgan & Company. Scrutiny was cast in the syndicate's direction. Alaska rose to the humorous notion of being first a colony of Russia, then a colony of Guggen Morgan. Stephen Birch, in the fall of 1902, stepped in to purchase pieces of the Bonanza claim from members of the McClellan Group, the original members including Clarence Warner and Jack Smith. Once acquired, a railway was quickly needed to establish any sort of permanent homestead in the area, seeing as the harsh environment was dangerous at nearly every turn. The most logical route from Kennecott to Valdez spanned nearly 200 miles. However, massive funds would be needed to complete the project. Construction began in June 1905, before Birch quickly ran out of money from initial investors. So he then turned to people like J.P. Morgan and Daniel Guggenheim, the latter of whom was already convinced to fund the project. With these funds, the railroad can be completed, for without transportation, the world's richest copper deposits were valueless. The man hired for the momentous task of constructing the railroad was Michael James Heaney, known to many as Big Mike. He was a railroad building pioneer, known for constructing the Canadian Pacific Railway, the Seattle Lakeshore and Eastern Railroad, and the White Pass and Yukon Route. His reputation garnered serious interest from the Alaska Syndicate's financial backers, and Heaney himself was attracted to the copper claims in the Copper River Valley. 
Founding the Copper River Railway Company in 1906, he began construction north from Cordova rather than in Valdez. Noting his success with the route, the syndicate abandoned their Valdez project and bought out Heaney's alternate route, contracting him to construct the newly named Copper River and Northwestern Railroad, or the CR and NW. Tensions rose between competitors aiming to build a route to Kennecott. Working on the abandoned Valdez route, a man named Henry Reynolds and his Alaska Home Railway Company attempted to continue the work abandoned earlier by this Alaska syndicate. Still holding the right of way to the only pass out of Valdez, Keystone Canyon, the Alaska Home Railway attempted to purchase the rights from the syndicate, who refused to sell. Valdez was, in fact, still their backup route in case of the failure of the new Cordova line. Attempting to take the Keystone Canyon by force, Reynolds and his men met armed syndicate guards. Opening fire on the Alaska Home Railway group, the guards ended up killing one person, all but halting attempts to continue up Keystone Canyon. When the tensions cooled, serious progress could finally be made on the CRNW Railroad. Michael Heaney and 450 men worked on the railroad over 1907 to 1908 River, growing to 3,000 men the following summer. The feat was incredible and Heaney's men worked tirelessly around the clock to get the project completed. By the winter of 1908 and 1909, the team reached the Copper River between Childs and Miles Glacier. Here, a bridge would need to span the river, and given the seasonal environment, as well as huge chunks of ice continuously breaking off the Miles Glacier, it would need to be one of the strongest ever constructed. But what would become known as the Miles Glacier Bridge was built in a matter of weeks in April of 1910. Having been temporarily spanned for the summer of 1909 to continue construction, the Copper River's relentless flow was heavily observed by Heaney's engineers. The bridge, its four spans each over 300 feet long, was put up just as ice began melting off the glacier in the spring of 1910. Designed to withstand building-sized chunks of ice and torrential waves from two nearby glaciers sliding off into the river below, it's one of the all-time engineering feats, once being heralded as impossible, and has since been designated a historic landmark. Because of its $1.4 million t price tag, it was nicknamed the Million Dollar Bridge. However, there was still plenty more track to construct, about 150 miles more, and several additional bridges that needed to be built ahead. Their deadline was quickly approaching too. The law required every railroad to be finished four years after breaking ground, and that time would arrive in the early spring of 1911. Later that year, in September 1910, the line was completed to Chitna, mile 132. Work continued through the winter. Heaney and his men endured frigid temperatures, sometimes dropping below negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit without wind chill and several feet thick of snow that blanketed the mountainous landscape they plowed over. Additionally, daytime lasted a mere five hours in the deadest of winters. The ground was so frozen that dynamite had to be used to dig holes. Two additional massive bridges were built. The first, the Gilihina Trestle, spanned 880 feet and rose 90 feet high, was made entirely of wood, and was completed in just eight days. The second bridge, standing nearly 240 feet above the Cuscalana River, took two frigid months to complete in the winter of 1910. Each incredible efforts of their own, it was because of their construction that the railway could open on time. At one mile per day, work continued forward, and on March 29, 1911, just as time was ending on their construction permit, the final, celebratory copper-made spike was driven to finish the 196 Copper River and Northwestern Railway. Unfortunately, Michael Heaney would not live to see its completion, having succumbed to tuberculosis the previous October. Totaling about $23.5 million, including the million-dollar bridge and $8.5 million in labor, it was well worth the cost considering over $200 million of copper that had been mined in the decades that followed. Work in Kennecott didn't wait for the railroad either. Throughout the line's three years of construction, supplies were brought into the town site by steamer ships and was assembled, all prepared for the CRNW to begin receiving ore. Just 10 days after the copper spike was hammered, the first train departed carrying $250,000 of copper, worth $3 million today. The newly constructed Copper River and Northwestern Railway was, in essence, virtually rebuilt during the first few years of operation. Avalanches, glacial activity, earthquakes, extreme temperatures, and flooding would cause the line to close several times between 1909 and 1914, 
sparking a need for raising the railbed and the construction of maintenance facilities. To help with the massive upkeep costs, the federal government even assisted the CRNW to afford maintenance on the rail line. All contributed to reducing closures past 1914, though trestles would still sometimes need to be reconstructed after winters rolled through and ice melted each spring. For about a month each year, the line was decommissioned as crews worked around the clock in repairing it for the coming season. Trains in later years would even stop running from November to late spring to save on fuel costs. On April 29, 1915, the CRNW, Alaska Syndicate, and other local companies and the holdings combined their shares into a new public company, the Kennecott Copper Corporation. Stephen Birch, one of the original owners and founders of the Alaska Syndicate, was chosen as the primary managing partner. This was seen as a risky move, though, given the rising scrutiny of monopolies and big businesses at the time. Kennecott itself was beginning to take shape as a fully-fledged town, and World War I's outbreak was largely responsible. With the onset of the war, copper prices skyrocketed, nearly doubling from pre-war times. Demand for the material was met with swift output in Kennecott, and their most productive year, 1916, produced 108 million pounds of copper ore, or $32 million, or over $850 million today, not including the silver that was also extracted, 280 tons by the mine's closure. One of the biggest challenges remaining was getting the copper down the 4,000-foot mountainside where Bonanza, Jumbo, and Erie mines were located, to the mill at Kennecott. Far too steep and inefficient to bring down by hand or horse over just a three-mile horizontal span, engineers settled on a relatively new idea in mining, aerial tramways. Though they'd been utilized for at least a century at mines, aerial tramways were the key for Kennecott's ore movement, spanning several miles up to the mines. Built by at least 50 men who started over the summer of 1908, the tramway and concentration mill were essentially driven into the mountainside, followed by a loading station, angle station, a system of towers, breakovers, and tension stations. In just one year, by 1909, the aerial tramway had been completed, with the 14-story concentration mill being finished in early 1911, just in time for the first train to arrive. Up to 100 tons per day were transported by the tramway down from the mines to be processed in its first year, and by 1915, Nearly 180,000 tons of ore were being transported down the mountain each year. Down below, at the actual site of Kennecott, development was quickly beginning on making it a fully-fledged town. Built quite literally into the mountainside, the entire town spanned only a half mile north to south, settled on dugout plateaus. Rail access was maximized given the town's linear nature, and buildings were built within proximity to each other to reduce local transportation expenses. The real challenge, however, came from the mine's natural place in the wilderness. Hundreds of miles from civilization and situated in a region with very few local native or prospector populations where rail was the only consistent means of access, Kennecott was relatively cut off from the outside world. During the periods when the rail line was shut down for repairs in the late winter, the town couldn't have been further from the world as a whole. Amenities were some of the first non-machinery items constructed at the town site because of this. A self-contained company town, Kennecott boasted many facilities such as a hospital, children's school, recreation hall, a general store, tennis and handball courts, a chicken coop, and even a dairy barn with cows. When visiting Kennecott, one of the most striking and immediate observations one typically makes is the gorgeous red paint covering the outside of nearly every building along the mountainside. The hospital, unique amongst most buildings, was painted a vibrant white for its visibility though it was more expensive than the cheap red paint chosen for nearly every other structure. Although they couldn't have known it at the time, the mine owner's choice of red as the main color scheme helps to enhance the beauty of the town against the natural landscape backdrop behind it. Over a hundred buildings were put up in just a few years, including the world's first ammonia leaching plant. This plant would ensure that nearly all copper, even of lower quality and quantity than 70% or greater ore being extracted in volumes, was obtained, maximizing outputs. Built in 1916, the plant was later paired with a flotation plant put up in 1923. It was here where fines, or ore under 2 millimeters in diameter, were sorted from unwanted material. With a combination of the two facilities, Kennecott's output was able to equal, if not surpass, all other western copper mills by 1924. Unfortunately, 1924 was the last year that major ore discoveries were made in the area, 
signaling the first step towards the mine eventual closure in 1938. At its height, 600 men worked in the mines in Milltown, split about evenly among them, and up to a thousand total people called Kennecott home. This not only included the men who worked here, but additionally their wives and children who were also here to make a new life. Miners were, often, described as captives of the economy, and would sometimes go from November to March without surfacing from below the mountain itself. A single locomotive operated underground between connected shafts, transporting copper ore to more efficient tramways, and still may be there to this day. The mines, each built with large bunk rooms and storehouses for resources, were able to supply the workers throughout the winter months, though spirits didn't typically run high. In fact, Tensions grew so great that in June of 1917, Kennecott experienced its only strike, revolving around flat wages. Miners believe that rather than earning a flat, one-rate wage, pay should fluctuate as the market does, increasing with higher outputs and copper prices. After 45 days of deliberation, the strike was settled with the promise of a wage increase and improved mining facilities. In an effort to improve the scene of the town, Kennecott's bosses moved their families to the town site hopefully encouraging workers to do the same. And while many ended up moving their wives and children to the area, many miners instead opted for the nearby town of McCarthy, just five miles south along the railway. McCarthy's story is also deeply tied to the Copper River and Northwestern Railway. As nearby Kennecott expanded, the parties of primary interest in the town laid down rules to keep order and prevent hazardous mishaps. Alcohol, for instance, was completely banned. Kennecott was, as envisioned by those in charge, a clean, efficient town dedicated to one job, extracting copper ore out of the mountain at the highest possible rates and with the lowest possible costs. Despite this, the human need for entertainment and personal enjoyment persisted, and thus the vice town of McCarthy was established. Cropping up from old tracts of land less suitable for mining, but still perfect for a small town, McCarthy's early pioneers faced a similar story to those first prospectors. Seasonal flooding would roll through McCarthy Creek and Kennecott River, creating huge tracts of swampland for much of the year, freezing over in winters. Summers were equally hazardous, with huge swarms of mosquitoes being a constant existence for a few months. Additionally, ice breaking from Kennecott Glacier could, at any point, create waves that rolled down the river as the ice blocks splashed into the glacial lake below, washing anything in its path. With the construction of the railway, McCarthy was finally able to establish itself as a formal town, needing a place to unwind after working, and forbidden from many common amenities back in Kennecott, miners would seek out McCarthy as a haven for entertainment. John Barrett, the first to own the land that makes up the town site, homesteaded 269 acres to the railway and other prospective people. Settlers officially founded the town in 1913, naming it after John McCarthy, a prospector that had recently drowned in a nearby river. Becoming Kennecott's vice town, liquor, brothels, gambling, and other lewd amenities became the highlights of the valley. And despite Kennecott's administrators' best efforts to encourage decent ways of living, even bringing in their own families, the apparent need for entertainment could not be stopped. A special train whistle was even devised by railroad engineers to alert the local saloons if a U.S. marshal was riding on board. After the mine and railway's closure in 1938, McCarthy's population plummeted. By 1952, only a family of three lived and served as town watchmen and would almost be entirely abandoned in the 1970s. Luckily, in 1980, the Carter administration created Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Preserve, growing tourism to the area. Today, the town is a small but vibrant hub for tourists and residents in the park. Environmental concerns were not of top priority for the Kennecott Corporation, and this was very understandable given the times and the remote location of the town. Trash and industrial waste were too costly to ship out, occupying a train car that could be used to ship tens of thousands of dollars of ore. Instead, workers would dump it onto the glacial moraine of the glacier's toe. Waste and sewage were piped into the nearby National Creek, flushing away and leaving a stain on the area's local natural balance. Untold amounts of heavy metals and other materials made their way into the surrounding environment, a tragedy the area is still dealing with today. With the onset of the Great Depression in 1929, copper prices began tanking. Costs to operate the mine, which hadn't discovered a new major deposit of copper in a few years, soared. 
As a result, many miners were laid off, signaling the beginning of the end for Kennecott. Seeking to squeeze every possible dollar out of the production, Administrator William C. Douglas installed new technology into the town site. Developed in 1915 at Kennecott, the ammonia leaching process in the town's ammonia leaching plant dissolved copper from lower grade ore, where it would then be floated. Flotation tanks would bubble oil to separate the mineral from whatever rock it was stuck in, and then removed from the tank where it was then recovered. Unfortunately, because of litigation over the patent, the leaching plant's construction was delayed. Additionally, the need for water and scarcity in the winters severely limited its use outside of warmer months. Regardless, the process was incredibly efficient, with up to 96% of ore recovered. Despite the more efficient copper recovery, wages didn't improve with time. Mine output was on the decline, and even with rising copper prices right before the depression hit, the boom could not be utilized by the company. Prices were still not near where they needed to be to recuperate costs, and it was the low prices that would spell Kennecott's end. Wages at Kennecott were typically good, though. At its peak in 1923, the mine contracted pay at $4.60 daily. After $1.45 for board and $0.08 cents for hospital dues, as well as having to slowly repay a $37 ship fare to Cordova and $23.40 train fare to Kennecott, workers could still expect to walk away with decent earnings, and this only rose with more technical jobs, with electricians and machinists earning up to $5.75 a day. Peaking just before 1929, Copper prices plummeted once the depression was in full swing, falling to just 5 cents per pound in 1931. Despite halting the expensive ammonia leaching process, the Kennecott Corporation still lost $2 million that year. The mine had to close from 1933 to 1934 due to a bridge getting washed out the previous October, leaving the mine stranded and inoperative, yielding no profits. Luckily for the Kennecott Corporation, they had smartly invested outside of Alaska in places like Chile and Utah which yielded abundant, though far lower grade copper at cheaper costs to extract. By 1938, the once great copper mine was seeing its end. In preparation for the closure of Kennecott, the workers shipped out. The final train departed on November 11, 1938, leaving behind a relic of the past. In all, more than 4.6 million tons of ore, 13% of which was 60% or greater or pure copper, was mined out of four mines. Bonanza, Jumbo, Erie, and Motherlode. Smelted down, the ore yielded nearly 600,000 tons or 1.3 billion pounds of copper, along with 280 tons or 562,000 pounds of silver. According to the administrators of at least $200 million of copper ore sold, Kennecott Copper Corporation and its financial backers netted $100 million in profit, or over $2.1 billion, in just 27 years of operation. After the last aerial tramway stopped and the machinery was brought to a halt, just 15 families remained living in the area. To access civilization, a road was needed for the remaining Kennecott and McCarthy residents. Thus, in 1941, the railroad voluntarily gave the right of way for the line to the federal government. Removing rail ties and regrading the path for cars, the infamous McCarthy Road was built. Many remnants of the former railway can still be seen today including the ingenious bridges built to carry copper to port. Seldom used, the road was improved to gravel in 1971 and partially paved for its first few miles, but it wouldn't see any serious traffic for decades. Mining as a whole did not see an end in the area, though. In 1965, the Consolidated Wrangell Mining Company temporarily reopened Bonanza Mine by purchasing 3,000 acres of the property. Mostly excavating leftover surface deposits in the area, it was able to earn its own profits as well, though nowhere remotely close to what was made in Kennecott's heyday. Records state that 32 tons of copper ore was flown via DC-3 from Kennecott to nearby Glen Allen by the mid-1970s. In 1976, a new venture, the Great Kennecott Land Company, acquired the rights to the lower half of Consolidated Wrangell's property. They subdivided the land for sale to the public and, as a result, Many parcels in Kennecott were purchased by individuals in the 1970s and 80s. This includes several parcels that contain structures related to the aerial tramways once carrying copper down from the mountain. Today, though, the copper mine is completely inactive. Its iconic red buildings and engineering marbles remain as testament to the ingenuity of the time. The town's mining heritage is today preserved as a National Historic Landmark. 
further protected deep inside the largest national park in the United States. The structure's iconic wood frame construction is highly reminiscent of the early 20th century building techniques. Dominated by the 14-story concentrator mill, the local area is rooted deep in history. Being designated a National Historic Landmark in 1986 and then acquired by the National Park Service in 1998, preservation finally had the serious financial backing needed to begin. Reports conducted by the NPS concluded that some buildings were unfortunately beyond repair. Fires, demolitions, and often complete structural failure brought them beyond repair. However, the other buildings, such as the 14-story mill house and power plant, remain and are being actively restored to their former glory. The most important projects, other than restoring the structural stability of buildings, are the removal of lead paint and asbestos. Hazardous waste and materials left behind are also in need of being removed if safe access and enjoyment is desired. With expected increased visitation to the park in the coming years and decades, especially to McCarthy and Kennecott, the need for safer conditions is crucial. Little about the way of living near McCarthy and Kennecott has changed since the mine's closure. The residents of the area are largely self-sufficient and extremely resilient. Water is sourced from the local river or, if you're lucky enough to have one, a well. Electricity is available in most spots, but visitors don't tend to find themselves on their phone as often, instead taking in the area. Wi-Fi itself is even harder to come by. In some situations, when weather conditions are poor or the road to town is inaccessible, supplies may take days or even weeks to arrive. Some residents of the area have remained there for decades, and families have inhabited the same plots for nearly a century. The location's unique, though difficult to access location, helps to keep its culture going, and the quiet life is what current inhabitants seek out. While few if any residents of Kennecott's operational days remain, many have participated in past reunions and interviews that give an insight into the daily life of the town. The social history was unique, though in many ways the location of Kennecott did not detract children and workers from living a typical life. At its peak in 1920, Kennecott inhabited 500 residents along with most miners who lived closer to the mines. Society then was bustling, and social events were common given the lengths the company went through to provide recreational facilities for its isolated workers. A two-room school provided classes for the town's children through 8th grade, who were then sent out of town for higher education. Because of the town's small population, classes sometimes contained just one or two students. Most children played intramural hockey or would ice skate during their free time, participate in school pie-eating contests, and fish and explore the local area. Summers included baseball games between Kennecott and McCarthy men for a $200 prize. Fishing, horseback riding, and large hunting expeditions were popular come fall. Weekly events even occurred at Kennecott, including movie screenings at the library. Berries, too, were very popular foraging items throughout the year, and residents would frequently use them to make jams. More adult entertainment existed down the train line in McCarthy, Alcohol and prostitution being banned in the Kennecott town site, miners would often hitch rides down to the Vice Town, where a brothel and bar supplied time off for many of the local miners and residents. Mail order brides, though, would sometimes find their way into Kennecott, responding to magazine ad inquiries by lonely men. The company would not have this, and thus get rid of them on the next return train. Other illicit activities did find their way into Kennecott, though, such as a lottery among workers on the time and date of the first train to arrive after winter closures. Sled dogs were the alternative mode of local transportation in winters, and miners too drunk to make the trip back to Kennecott would be hauled by teams on sled with tucked in sleeping bags. Other winter recreation included skiing down the mountainside. Workers would take the aerial tramway up the angle stations along the tram's length and ski about a three mile run back down to the mill. The tram was also the only way up for miners in winters. Failures of power lines to the trams sometimes occurred, though, leading to ingenious methods of transportation. Gravity itself was used, the loaded buckets being about 700 pounds heavier than those going up to the mine. Men in snowshoes would, when snow permitted after storms blew out the power lines, make the repairs. The power plant at the Kennecott mill site was one of, if not the largest in Alaska at the time. Powered by steam, water, and diesel, the plant could output 2,750 kilowatts. Oil fire would heat the boilers, 
which would then power the turbines and feed heat into buildings and furnished homes. There was no heat in the Alaska sun, only light. As quoted by electrician Wesley O. Bloom, who worked in Kennecott for seven years, at 30 degrees below zero, the steam plant was a nice place to work. Long summer days would be replaced by long winter nights, with the sun sometimes coming up for no more than six hours a day. Nighttime would sometimes make for a brilliant light show when the green northern lights came out. Otherwise, though, wintertime in Kennecott and McCarthy were quiet and desolate, with few venturing outside once temperatures got under negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Christmas, though, was a joyous time in the town, with the leaching plant being shut down and work off for the day. The workers got just two days off per year, some years, the 4th of July and Christmas. Radio was available to the inhabitants as well, providing some digital entertainment. Ham radio operators even indulged in the hobby, contacting the outside world to hear of news and events. It was a primary means of reaching others and a quick way to report on any incidents up in the town that may occur. Typically, transmissions reached the towns of Chitna and Cordova, though sometimes would extend to southeast Alaska. A single phone located in the general store was, besides written mail, the only other means of outside communication. Goods were very often shipped into town by train from the outside. Kids would receive toys, books, and clothing, most of which weren't regularly available from the town stores. The nicest dress was usually saved for school and special events, while practical overalls were suitable for most other occasions. Winters meant children would wear long stockings, layers, and bulky wool snowsuits. The same was true for adults. Miners would typically wear the same clothes for days while working, and only those who could afford them wore finer clothing such as suits and jackets, typically the administrators. Dogs populated both Kennecott and McCarthy and still inhabit the latter town today as kind yet freely roaming pets. Situated for the colder climate of Alaska, breeds such as Malamutes and Huskies, Shepherds and Labs are found in many family homes. These loving companions made life in remote wilderness easier for all. The strongest dogs were used for sledding and hauling supplies during the winter months between and around Kennecott and McCarthy. The town's freedom was not kind to all who partook of it, though. Miners' drunkenness sometimes led to trouble as they made the lengthy trek back to Kennecott, and sometimes men would end up too wasted, falling asleep along the trail between the towns. In winters, men would lose digits from frostbite. One story tells a man two into his cups and passed out along the tracks between towns. The train passing that day was unable to stop before running over him, cutting his legs off. By the time the train crew called Kennecott Hospital and a truck was sent to get him, the man had died from shock and blood loss. He was put into a coffin and buried in the Kennecott Cemetery. It was far too costly to ship him out of town. Living together as one large family, the residents of Kennecott depended on each other in many ways. Workers from all over the world came to Kennecott to earn money for themselves and their families, including nationalities such as Greeks, Italians, Irish, Swedes, Finns, Yugoslavians, Japanese, Russians, and more. There were little language problems, too, as most workers were bilingual and could, surprisingly, read well. For life and to keep up a decent way of living, many people took on numerous roles and worked together to make the town prosperous outside of its extraordinary material value. Unions were strong, and the men working there took pride in what they were doing. It's thanks to Kennecott's success, too, that we have so many items that use copper. From the nation's power lines to using the copper for minting pennies, Kennecott's history can be found all around the country and the globe. The unique and intriguing lifestyle in this remote mining town is now only remembered in interviews and old film photographs.